Welcome to Backstage with Jeffrey Morrissey. Uh, I am your host, Jeffrey Morrissey. I am so pleasured to be at the Orpheum Theater today and joined by Jen Clower. Jen, how are you? Very well. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time. I do appreciate it. Pleasure. So one of the uh, interesting things that I found that I'm sure everyone talks to you about your backstory is how you started out in acting, moved to music. Uh, what is it about music that drew you there that either you weren't getting the creative fulfillment for acting? Why did you decide to sort of make that change? Sure. Well, I, I love performing, you know, whether it's acting or, um, you know, performing music. Um, but I think what really drew me to music was the freedom where you can just pick up a guitar and you can write your own songs and you can choose when you want to record them and go out and tour them. There's a lot of independence around making music, whereas I felt you know, and bear in mind, this is a good 20 years ago when I was acting, um, that you were often kind of waiting for the phone to ring um, and it was a lot harder to get projects up. Um, so, yeah, I just, I love the, um, I guess, yeah, just the the ability to DIY and do your own thing. And you're very good at it too, especially with all the DIY stuff. Um, but one of the things that strikes me about uh, your music and a lot of the music that's coming out of Australia and New Zealand right now are just the incredible, incredible lyrics. Mm. Uh, and I know that songwriting is a priority for you and that with this record, you, uh, quote, discovered that writing is about sitting down and being there. Mm. So I, I know that you have a lot on your plate with sort of the milk stuff, running the label, trying to record your own music. So how do you manage your time? What, what are some keys or tips and tricks for time management? Sure. I mean, I don't always get it right and, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I'm, I'm by no means a kind of master of, of time management but, you know, things that I have discovered that work well is just kind of allotting time to everything. So not letting some things be ignored and build up like bookkeeping and, you mm -hmm. know, the stuff no one wants to do. Um, and also when I'm, you know, when I'm at home and I have some time, you know, over a few months I will definitely dedicate the time in the morning to just sitting down as I said and just being there for a couple of hours and and writing you know and sometimes you know it flows and it feels fantastic and you you get you know all of this wonderful you know juice for a new song and sometimes it's just really kind of hard going but the thing that I've learned is just showing up because if you don't sit there and write nothing gets written well, and to say that this album is showing up would be an absolute understatement. Uh, so y you really did knock it out of the park, uh, which I, I'm sure you've heard so many times before. Thanks. Um, but uh, when, you, when you're sort of creating these songs, do you get sort of your release, your expression, sort of the, the relief, the release from it when you're writing them or when you put them out to the world, when you perform them on stage? Where does that emotional sort of openness come for you? Sure. Yeah, look, I, I think there's always a great sense when you finish a song. And for me, you know, the first, I mean, there's different stages of finishing a song, but, but I guess that feeling where you go, I'm happy with the lyric, I'm, I'm really happy with the melody and the arrangement feels pretty good. And I'm the kind of writer that will really bring a song pretty much fully you know, completed as far as arrangement and ideas to the band. So there's not a lot of kind of writing in the studio with the band. Um, obviously, they come up with, you know, all of their amazing parts um, as we're rehearsing and, and um, recording. Um, yeah, and I guess there's also that sense when you're recording where you get to a point where you feel like this is the version of the song that I want to release, you know, and that can come really quickly or that can take some time depending on, you know, the song. Um, and, and then, I mean, you know, this is a three-part answer, really. Mm -hmm. Then there's the performing of the song, you know, and finally seeing that song kind of land on an audience. And also over time, the song will develop and you'll see, um, you know, the, song, the song's power will start to come through. And that can be really interesting as a songwriter to kind of go, wow, this song is a lot more powerful than I'd expected. Because it's really only until you're in a live environment and you have an audience there that I think the song really truly lives, particularly I think with rock music, you know, and it's a fairly classic rock album um, and you need that audience to feed off, you know, the energy of the band. And as you've been playing these shows, what has been one of those songs that its power is being revealed as you start playing it more and more? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, the shows that I've been uh, playing with Kurt and Courtney around the States have been solo shows. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess there hasn't really been a huge experience of seeing, you know, it's just me and acoustic guitar, um, of seeing sort of songs develop in a big way live. 
Um, but when I'm playing with the band, um, we just did a, a UK and Europe tour with the band and we'll be back in the States playing um, band shows. Um, there's a song called Forgot Myself, which is mm. the first song on the album. Uh, and that has really um, become, you know, a really big song live. And also a Strong Woman, um, which is a bit further into the album. I guess they're the more kind of rock songs on the album but yeah those those songs have been really um interesting to watch turn into something bigger than us and and strong woman especially just sort of i'm going back because i i read all the lyrics before coming here too i listened to the album but i always like to read the lyrics too mm. and especially when you sit down for me even reading the lyrics and sort of going through it like almost like an article mm. that's where i found like even more power in that and really mm. having a chance to digest those so yeah it's a wonderful song. Um, but as you mentioned, uh, these are your first shows in the States. Uh, mm. So how has that been going? Have you noticed any differences with audiences or anything like that? Uh, what, what's been your impression so far? Yeah, I mean, the, the audiences have been fantastic. And bearing in mind, you know, uh, I'm opening for Courtney and Kurt. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people coming through the doors, you know, haven't heard of me before there's obviously a few milk fans or court hardcore you know courtney fans who might have heard some of my stuff which is great mm -hmm. um so it's it's that kind of interesting thing of walking out onto a stage and really introducing yourself to people for the first time um and by the end of the show i've really noticed um you know people coming a lot closer and coming into the into the experience and and my world and and what i'm talking about and the audiences here have been so warm and appreciative and um, quite vocal, which I love. Um, yeah, a lot of my friends, a lot of my Australian friends have said that American audiences are the best. Like they're just so positive and not frightened to give you a standing ovation and really celebrate, you know, musicians, which is, which is true. Well, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, and I mean, the acting background must be one of those things when you're going out on stage for the first time, especially, as you said, an audience that might not know you and introducing yourself. I mean, some of those techniques must come in handy there to some extent. Yeah, I think so. I think more than anything, um, you know, coming to music a little bit later, you know, by the time I started performing with a band, um, I would have been in my late 20s, you know, so most people were kind of veterans of music by that stage. Um, but because I'd had all of that time as an actor, um, you know, being on stage and being under lights and getting used to an audience being there, I think it's really helped me to just relax and, and feel at home on a stage. And a lot of people kind of note that, you know, she seems really relaxed on stage. And I think it's just come from, you know, years and years of uh, acting and being out there in front of people. Well, nice, nice. I, I do want to take a moment and talk about your latest release, or I guess re-release would be a better way to put it, uh, the song Numbers for the 30 Days of Yes campaign, mm. which is just uh, one of the coolest campaigns between you guys, Julia Jacqueline, mm. Marlon Williams, like just some of the best music from uh, from Down Under. It's been so awesome mm. to see. But it, it's one of my top five favorite love songs, um, it, not necessarily because I can relate to the lyrical content of it, mm. but just the connection in the voices and mm. the honesty, uh, the love there is just so apparent from the moment that that song starts. Mm. Um, so please just take me through, if you can remember back to the writing of that, because I think that was fairly early in your relationship with Courtney, right? Yeah, it was. It was It was actually, we started writing that song before we were even partners. Really? So, yeah, we were just wow. sort of like hanging out and I was writing, um, at the time I was writing a whole lot of duets with different songwriters as a as an exercise in collaboration and to see what you could do with another songwriter and um, and where it would take, you know, form and where it might go. Um, and it's quite interesting, you know, sitting down with a songwriter that you don't necessarily know and going, okay, let's write a song together. <laughs> you know, it was kind of um, challenging. Um, but, yeah, Courtney was one of the songwriters that, that I asked to um, to collaborate with and – yeah, I remember sitting down um, and, and just, you know, she came up with those kind of quite hypnotic chords and just started singing a melody and then, you know, we started to work on the lyric together. Um, and it's kind of interesting when you're writing a song with another person because, you know, you might just bring a little thing to the song but it can really make it, you know. So there's little kind of flourishes and touches in a pretty simple song um, that I remember kind of you know, writing together. So, yeah, that's kind of, I mean, you know, the song really is is, is about, you know, not, not using age um, as, a, as a way of sort of discriminating against, you know, 
the idea of relating to someone else, you know, whether that's in a romantic partnership or otherwise. Um, and I feel like that's really shifted that whole idea of age. Mm. I feel like younger people these days are much more chilled around gender, around age. You know, there's not all of these weird kind of rules, um, which I like. I like it too. And do you find when you're collaborating with people that you know better, is that more difficult? Is it easier? Because th there's history and tension, but at the same time, you both know each other a lot more than you would just someone that you meet off the street or someone that you just ring up and say, do you want to write a song? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It kind of, I think it's like anything. There's, there's either a chemistry there or there isn't. And mm. that's what you kind of discover, whether it's someone you know or you haven't met. Um, there's, there's just that strange sort of thing that, that sometimes it's there and you can write together. I'm not the biggest fan of collaborating. Like, I, I think for me, you know, I really enjoy, I both despise and enjoy um, the experience of having to sit down by yourself and sometimes it can be really lonely. But also I like the depth that you can go into lyrically. And I think that's the thing that I've discovered with collaborating is that um, particularly if you're writing the lyrics together, you don't have the same kind of time to really delve into and and find that attention to detail. So, yeah, you know, it can be good. Well, perfect, perfect. Uh, and then so uh, sort of relating back to the whole 30 Days of Yes campaign and then as well as your own album is, as well, it really does sort of blend both art and advocacy and the personal and the political, and it sort of brings it all to one. So how do you see the relation between both, you know, personal and political, art and advocacy, and, and sort of blending all of those things when you're writing, when you're creating music? Sure. Yeah, look, I don't know whether, you know, uh, those ideas of, you know, I'm going to write a political song or I'm going to advocate for a certain, you know, cause or something that I have, you know, that's close to my heart. Um, you know, I just I just write. And then if it sort of takes form or turns a corner, um, I think you need to be very careful if you start to discuss politics in music. Um, you know, there's the majority of the songs on my album are very personal topics and if I do kind of venture into anything political it's generally coming from my own experience there's only one song on the record which I researched you know mm -hmm. in so much depth which is kind of biblical which really you know delves into why would someone vote for your current um, administration um, a good question <laughs> yeah but I wanted to understand because I think the issue the issue that we have in the world at the moment is no one's willing to understand the other person's viewpoint or understand how things have come to be the way they are. It's just a kind of shouting match and I'm really interested in having that conversation and actually understanding each other so that you can at least try and move forward in some way. Mm. Um, so, yeah, um, you know, I think it's important. I think that we live in a world at the moment, as a, you know, as anyone, artist or not, um, where to ignore, you know, what's going on, you know, to, to ignore politics, to not feel in some way, you know, some empathy and compassion and connection for people struggling um, is, is a disservice, you know, both to yourself and, um, you know, I don't know, to, to people showing up at shows as well. Like I've loved watching people connect with the themes in my songs and, and you know, it's a good feeling to look up on a stage and, and hear someone reflecting back some of the stuff that, you know, might have been irking you or causing you some grief. Um, you know, one of the songs I talk about, the um, which, you've, you, which you've already mentioned, the, the uh, marriage equality debate that's been going on in Australia over the last sort of year, really, but they've just had a, a, a public opinion poll, um, so it's not legally binding, it's not a referendum, it doesn't change legislation, it's just a popular vote. Um, which has cost $122 million worth of taxpayers' money to uh, find out whether the Australian public thinks same-sex couples should be able to marry legally. Um, and it's kind of been, uh, you know, it, it's it's been a waste of time because there's plenty of polls that would show that, yes, yeah, at exactly. least two-thirds of the Australian population feel totally fine about that. Um, but I guess it's just all part of that regressive... Um, politics that we're seeing in the world um, and in Australia it's kind of come in the form of you know not taking responsibility uh, not 
you know, doing your job and actually passing legislation and falling back on lazy techniques like public opinion polls where, you know, you hope you don't lose any votes. You don't want to, you know, go and pass a law because you might lose, you know, votes from your base. So anyway, I could wrap it on about that forever. That was a very long answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was engaging. I, I, it, was, it was a great answer. And um, yeah, it, it, I'm interested just from your perspective, because this is the, the first time you've sort of been touring through the states. Have you found any of the answers that you were looking for, I guess, on Kind of Biblical by coming to America and seeing what's going on here and interacting with people? Has that shed some light on things for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, to be fair, I haven't really had a chance to go deep into, you know, American society and really talk to a whole lot of different people. I mean, I've been playing shows and, and you know, that life really just revolves around getting in a bus, going to the next town, <laughs> jumping out of the bus, doing a few interviews, doing a show, getting back on the bus. Um, but I, you know, I have had a chance to kind of look around in every city and, and also talk to some of the American, you know, crew and band members on this tour. And I can really see, um, first of all, just how many people live on the street um, and the and the level of poverty in this country and how hard and tough it is um, and how quickly, um, if something goes wrong in your life around your health or there's a bad turn of events or you lose a job, um, how quickly you can end up uh, in in some really dire circumstances, um, that there isn't a sense of security in American society, that people are terrified, you know, terrified of getting sick and not having health cover or terrified of losing a job and not being able to find, you know, a job and how quickly you can become someone living on, a, on the streets, you know, and I think that reality check, um, you know, it's the kind of same thing that I examined in kind of biblical is, you know, people are frightened and when people are frightened and they don't feel secure they'll make choices and decisions that they probably wouldn't normally make very true very true Mm. well i know it's going to be a little bit of a hard left turn but i'm going to get us on a little bit of a happier subject Uh, Mm -hmm. it's a long flight from australia wow that was a very poor segue uh it's a long long flight uh from australia to the states so if you could pick anyone living or dead to be sitting next to you and you could sort of chat with them uh pick their brain for the flight who would you want to uh, talk with uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure she's Canadian, but mm-hmm. she lives in Nova Scotia. Uh, there's a Buddhist nun called Pema Chodron. She'd be in her early 80s now. And um, I love her. You know, she's been teaching and writing books and um, doing all sorts of things for the last 40 years. She started out, you know, living living the life of, uh, you know, um, a married woman with children. And then I think around her 40s, she um, made the decision to become um, a Buddhist nun. Um, and I just, yeah, I could easily spend uh, a whole plane trip just sitting next to her while she just talked. Lots of wisdom around living in a crazy world without going insane. And the, and we all need some of that, that's for sure. <laughs> and you do a ton of these interviews, which is a journalist and other journalists I know appreciate. Um, what do you wish that you had the chance to talk about more often? What do you wish that we asked you more often in these uh, conversations? Look, to be honest, I, I I have found all of the interviews, particularly around this album, where I think I have, um, you know, delivered an album that is very personal but also very relatable and quite current as far as, you know, what's going on um, in the world, around world politics. There's a lot to talk about. And I think if anything that I've learnt from releasing an album like that, it's much easier uh, to talk about the album because you're not just going, oh, this, you know, song's about my relationship that went sour or, you know, there's plenty of personal stuff in there and reflections on love and life. Um, but there's also uh, a greater depth um, to where I kind of go. And so all of the interviews, I have not had a single one um, that hasn't been engaging and interesting. So I'm really happy about that. Me as well, me as well. I, I literally have a list uh, of questions here that we could probably take the whole plane ride to Australia for, <laughs> uh, but I don't want to keep you that long. I know you have things to do, so this will be my last one. Who are you listening to right now? Uh, who has your ear? Sure. Um, there's an amazing band in Australia called the Orb Weavers. The Orb Weaver is mm-hmm. a kind of spider. It's quite a beautiful black spider you would often find in an Australian garden. I don't know if they exist outside of Australia. It's very possible that they do. Um, but yeah, they've just released their, I think, third album. It's called Deep Leads. 
and it's yeah just some of the most beautiful tender songwriting they're very much connected to Australian history and particularly natural history um, so yeah whenever you go along and see an orb weavers show um, Marita Dyson the main um, songwriter and vocalist will tell you all sorts of really interesting stories about the history of Melbourne um, particularly from like a kind of natural environmental perspective um, which is rare it's not mm. the kind of thing you normally hear at a gig um, but yeah I really encourage anyone to go and take a listen to that album because it's beautiful of course and if you're not listening to uh, the self-titled release by Jen Cloer I, I don't know what you're waiting for you're missing out definitely go and do that Jen thank you so much for the time today thank you